Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambhudasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambhudasa Homage to the blessed noble and perfectly enlightened one Namo sarando sucedo ye alahadi sammyao sanputoshi. Namo sarando sucedo ye alahadi sammyao sanputoshi. Wusham shen shen wei miao fa bai qian wan jie nan sao yu. Wo jin jian wan de shou chi yuan jie ru lai chen shi yi. Supreme and wondrous dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered even in billions of eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. May it be so. Shifu Shangren, Gwei, Shishung, Dajia, Ami Tofo, Venerable Master, Dhamma Friends, welcome to our Sutra Lecture today. My name is Hung Shur. It is Sunday, February the 4th, here in the Gold Coast of Queensland. It's Saturday night, the 3rd of February, back in California. Hope you're all well. Uh, we've got a, an exciting, I will say, fascinating, uh, mystical episode of our investigation of entering the Dharma realm chapter today. All of that good stuff. Uh, there's lots happening, and I can't wait to get into it. Let's uh, see here. There we go. Let's first invoke spiritual presence here, and I want to, before we do, express my gratitude to all of the hands and the hearts that go into putting this lecture on the air. Um, our, some of our varsity translators are down with COVID, uh, and uh, we uh, appreciate their efforts and wish them quick recovery. And we're also grateful for the friends who are translating into Vietnamese and those who are putting this uh, broadcast out on YouTube and on Zoom in a variety of languages. So with all them in mind, let's invoke spiritual presence. Here we go.
gratitude to Ashoka Banjos. My goodness, check it out online. Uh, we'd like to respectfully acknowledge the Kombumeri people of the Ugambi language region as traditional storytellers and custodians of the land where our monastery is located. Pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging, and to all First Nations people whose sovereignty was never ceded. Finally, we want to add a traditional sound to our opening protocols with the bell sound. Bell sound wide resound throughout a hundred million worlds. The Buddha's law is heard and spread all throughout the triple world. The wondrous sounds that everywhere Fill the Dharma realm with peace. May those who hear it gain the strength to follow in faith the Buddha's path. So oh, let's see here. There we go. Now it's uh, it's not often that the um, teachings of the Buddha both correspond with and dance around folklore and science all at once. But today is one of those times when the Avatamsaka Sutra suggests that if you only looked fast enough or looked out of the corner of your eye, you could find on a map precisely where the Buddha is speaking Dharma, that that place really exists in our earth reckoning, right, on our maps. Uh, doesn't, but it's tempting, and, and it's one of those overlays, and it's like, now you see it, now you don't. That's, that's one aspect, because there's, the sutra mentions a place, and that place um, might be down in southern India. And there are scholars who will tell you that they found it. Uh, however, we also have Buddhist legends that talk about things like the Dragon Palace under the sea. And of course, as soon as you talk about the Dragon Palace under the sea, geographers have to roll their eyes and go, we haven't found that one yet, ha, ha, ha. Uh, and yet, tell me any folklore in the world that has not registered dragons at some point or another. Uh, from St. George and the Dragon and European mythology, not so myth mythological, maybe very historical, to uh, Chinese and Indian folklore that absolutely say, dragons uh, existed and uh, they're in our human memory. Um, to the people who <laughs> love to find dragons in the clouds. Um, we have in our Buddhist community lots of cloud watchers who love to find dragons. And I'll, I, I won't get there yet, but our, my Dharma brother, Jin Yong Shi, has suggested that 
maybe we should take another look at what are called atmospheric rivers now, currently dropping a lot of rain over Northern California. When you look at uh, NOAA, the, the, uh, the, aeron- the uh, atmospheric um, research, the, the, the chief weathermen of the government, they publish pictures of Pineapple Express atmospheric rivers, they look an awful lot like dragons. So, yeah, so that's what I'm, my point. Today's lecture, uh, the beginning of Di San Jen, the third scroll of the Entering the Dharma Realm chapter, we're reading about Manjushri's travels down to the realm of humans, and a whole lot of it makes you want to go, whoa, wait a minute. Is that folklore? Is that sutra? Is it real life? They all kind of overlap. They, they, they inter, intersperse and dance with each other. So it's fascinating, fascinating stuff. Are we ready? Let's take a look. Here it is. I'll do the title. Here we go. Da Fang Guang Fu Hua Yan Jing Ru Fa Jie Ping Di San Shi Jiu Zhi San. Avatamsaka Sutra, entering the Dharma Realm, Section Three. Okay, here we go. I'll read just this first paragraph. Here we go. So you are not sharing your screen yet. I'm not sharing my screen yet. Why not? Why aren't I sharing my screen? I should know better by now. Here we go. Got it. Thank you. Thanks, Jerry. Our Shi Wan Shu Shili Pusa Chen Chu Bi Cho Fa Ano Dolo Samyao Samputi Shin Yi Chen Si Nan Xing Jing Li Ran Jian Chi Fu Chang Dong Zhu Zhuang Yan Chuang Solo Lin Zhong Wang Shi Zhu Fo Zeng So Zhi Zhu Jiao Hua Zhong Sheng Da Ta Miao Chu Yi Shi Shi Zun Yu Wang Shi Shi Xiu Pu Sa Heng Neng She Wu Liang Nan She Zhi Chu Shi Gu Tsu Lin Ming Cheng Pu Wen Wu Liang Fu Cha Tsu Chu Chang Wei Tian Long Ye Cha Qian Ta Po A Xiu Lo Jia Lo Lo Jin Lo Lo at that time, Bodhisattva Manjushri, upon exhorting the bhikshus to bring forth the resolve for Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, gradually traveled south to the human realm. He went to the east of the City of Blessings to stop in the Sala Grove, named Adorned Banner. All Buddhas of the past had lived and taught and transformed beings in this grove. Manjushri went to the great stupa, a site where world-honored ones had cultivated bodhisattva practices in the past, a place where they were able to perform difficult deeds of renunciation. For that reason, the grove was renowned throughout measureless Buddha kshetras and was constantly blessed with the offerings of the gods dragons, yakshas, gandharvas, asuras, garudas, kinaras, maharagas, humans, and non-humans. Okay. All right. Manjushri Bodhisattva, we've been following him. Uh, At the end of scroll two, he accepted 6,000 new students. Uh, It's a movement, huh? New bhikshus who were set foot on the Bodhisattva path because they were so impressed by Manjushri. Uh, his blessings, his style, his zizai, the, the, the self-mastery that he displayed. So um, he taught them, he gave them some instructions, set their feet solidly on the Bodhisattva path and said, don't, th- if you want to succeed, you want to become a Buddha, Number one is, while walking the bodhisattva path, don't get fed up. Uh, don't weary of it. You've got to have a long, patient attitude, and you'll succeed, he said. So he continued uh, with his following of spirits traveling with him and came down 
because he's got a appointment. He has he has got a teaching uh, appointment with a young man named Sudana. So he's coming down to start the uh, this teaching on entering the Dharma realm, and he travels south. South, it's specified in the commentaries because south is where the light first rises. And it's the dawn, it says. Now people go, well, that's east. Mm. In, in terms of new life, uh, south. So that's the, uh, the new life is the, the new Bodhi resolve that Manjushri is going to kindle in the heart of Shantai Sudhana. So he goes where? He goes to the city of blessings, just to the east of the city of blessings, because there is a tree grove. There's a, what, forest? There's a orchard? There's a park? There's some bushland? It's a grove. Um, in Chinese, it's easy because it's trees. You just stick with wood radical together. Mu, lin, sun, one tree, two trees, three trees. That's where it is. That's where he's going to teach. And in, um, there are sections of our chapter here, entering the Dharma realm, where Sudhana encounters uh, various teachers and he has them, he says, tell me how did you first make the Bodhi resolve? And they, many of them will say, well, I was in another world, um, I was in another body, I had another lifetime, and the Buddha showed up in my town and it was in a grove of trees. And, or he showed up and there was a, like a lake or a pond and a great lotus flower rose up out of the water and the Buddha, you know, so he, uh, Sudhana hears these stories about how the Buddha showed up and there's always nature involved and often it has to do with trees, groves of trees. So take a look. Not that one. I want that one. Oh. We, when we hear about the, our Buddha, Shakyamuni, we always think, oh, Bodhi tree, right? They're, the Bodhi tree is kind of synonymous with the Buddha. The Buddha gets enlightened under a tree, but guess what? It's not the same tree every time. Seven past Buddhas, who we, whose names we heard two weeks ago, uh, seven past Buddhas got enlightened under seven different trees. Who knew? So, there is a commentary, a wonderful text from the Tang called the Fai Yuan Zhu Lin, where the, the names of the trees that the Buddhas get enlightened under, and which Buddha, are, are they kept track. And now people are going, wait a minute, wait a minute, past Buddhas? Yes, there are. We know who was the Buddha before Shakyamuni, before him and before him, seven back. Actually, the names are, go back uh, in the hundreds, but in particular, these seven. Um, here they are. Vipassin Buddha attained the way under a Pataliya tree. My research couldn't come up with any other name but Pataliya. If anybody knows, somebody online can tell me which... Uh, what, what, what variety of tree, if you got the Latin name for it or the common name for it, please do. Pataliya tree. Shikin Buddha was number six most ancient. He became a Buddha under the Pundarika tree, which is a white lotus. So underneath a, a tree with lotus flowers, Shikin Buddha, that was his Bodhi tree. Vishvabhu Buddha, third most ancient, uh, became a Buddha under a sala tree. And 
Sala is, that's the name of it, it's a Sala tree. And our, the Buddha in our story went to, uh, came also, notice, here. Stop in the Sala grove. Sometimes pronounced Shala, but Sala, without the accent. So, Sala grove. So our uh, Manjushri is stopping under a Sala grove. Same as Vishvabhu Buddha. Uh, one source says Sala just means green, green tree. Krakuchanda Buddha attained the way and became the Buddha under a Shirisha tree, which is an acacia, a kind of acacia, the Shirisha tree. Kanaka Muni Buddha became a Buddha under the Udumbara. The Udumbara tree is the Ficus Rasimosa, which is, means auspicious flower from the heavens. Udumbara flowers are one of those magical flowers that we've, uh, we have seen them here at Golkostama realm, Udumbara flowers. They're not supposed to appear except once every number of thousands of years. So that's the name of a, another Bodhi tree. Kashyapa Buddha, the Buddha preceding Shakyamuni, became a Buddha under a banyan tree the Nigrodra, Nigro, Niagroda tree, banyan tree. And our Buddha, Shakyamuni Buddha, became a Buddha under the Ashvata tree, which is the ficus relig religiosa, known as the Bodhi tree, the sacred fig, ficus religiosa. So, man, oh man, that's so interesting. Um, there, is, there is a lot, a lot of teaching about trees, sacred trees, and spirituality. So much so that um, many uh, indigenous faiths, Wicca uh, in Great Britain, uh, Taoism, and, and uh, Shintoism in Japan, Taoism in China, all pay close attention to trees and the idea that uh, Norse mythology, North mythology has everything to do with uh, um, forgotten the name of the tree of life. It'll come to me later. So uh, much of the stories of creation and sustenance of a culture and a people have to do with trees. So no surprise that Buddhism does the same and Buddhas are related to trees. So what I was amused by was that the tree changes. India has been uh, a culture for so many thousands of years going straight back. And with a population as large as India's, many of the trees that once covered it back in, in uh, three, four, five thousand years ago have been uh, have disappeared. But the idea, and here's, this is something that I wanted to share. The idea that there is a place in the spiritual landscape of the Avatamsaka Sutra where Buddhas return. They come back. So that's what I say. It kind of crosses over into folklore, into geography and into dharma is that Buddhas come where living beings can be taught. And is this a place in India? Um, there is scholarship that will tell you that City of Blessings is an actual place down in Orissa in southern India. And that this grove is popular among Buddhas because it's a place for teaching. That's where they come. Um, there are cities in India that uh, are said to be full of blessings. And so Buddhas return and make their residence in those cities over and over because now you think, is it chicken or the egg? Is it because the city has blessings it draws people there who are full of arts and full of virtue and kindness and education? Or is it that the people who are 
in, who are that way, who are full of blessings, just recreate the city wherever they go. So it's, the answer is chicken or egg, you pick. In any case, uh, Buddha's return to this grove of trees named the Dorn Banner. And when you, uh, when you find that grove, there's, there, there has to be an atmosphere there of openness to wisdom and insight. So that's, that's the case. Um, landscape has its qualities. Uh, one of America's, North America's, most uh, stunning, spectacular places is Yosemite National Park in California, Central California. John Muir, one of uh, California's famous sons, uh, traveled there and saw the sunlight uh, reflecting off of Half Dome and said, I think I've gone to heaven. And he went on uh, to, to write about it and popularize it and preserve it for future generations. Ansel Adams, famous photographer, uh, turned his camera on Half Dome and, uh, and just created art that when people see it, they, it takes their breath away. Um, another place, also in California, where people step into this environment and they have spiritual thoughts is redwood groves, where redwood trees, sequoia trees. Uh, there's just something magnificent about them and the atmosphere that they project that touches the human imagination, spiritual imagination. Um, another place on the planet that has the same effect are the Rocky Mountains of Colorado. Um, these, these are all, the, both three places I mentioned are in America, but um, we had a, a, growing up in Toledo, Ohio, one of the, the uh, claims to fame about my small city, in Northwestern Ohio, is the sport of wrestling. <laughs> We happen, University of Toledo happened to be famous for its freestyle and Greco-Roman wrestling qualities, so much so that uh, Olympic wrestling events were held in Toledo. And one year, my, my father, my, both my parents uh, were uh, fond of uh, international things, of, of expanding our encounters in language and food and culture. So when the world wrestling competitions were held in Toledo, uh, my parents volunteered to host some of the wrestling teams. And we hosted the team from Russia. Uh, this was back during a detente uh, when the Cold War, we were looking for reasons to stop the Cold War. And having the Russian wrestling team uh, come to Toledo, we were able to host, bring to my house, Vladimir Zviagin, who was the uh, uh, world heavyweight wrestling champ. And just, I mean, I, I was so impressed with, with Mr. Zviagin. And uh, his, uh, his translator came and some other members of the team came to, came to our house and had dinner and and uh, listen to music on the hi-fi. And the translator, um, I've forgotten his name, he was a fan of bluegrass music. And he wanted nothing so much as to go back to Russia with a banjo. So we bought him a bluegrass banjo and sent him back to Russia with a bluegrass banjo. But um, the Russian wrestling team said to us, back to our story about places that have spiritual uh, connections, they said, we have, in, during wrestling competitions, we've traveled pretty much the whole world from Europe to Latin America. And uh, of all of, we, at one point we, we wrestled in Denver and the Colorado Rockies are the most beautiful mountain range in the world, according to us. We've seen the Caucasus, we've seen the Urals, we've seen the, the uh, you know, 
uh, Mont Blanc and, and the Swiss Alps and nothing touches the Colorado Rockies. They say. So places have spiritual resonance for sure. And uh, the Sala Grove here, the Sala Grove, where Buddhas come over and over, all Buddhas of the past lived, teach, and transform beings in this grove. Furthermore, there is a stupa there where World Honored Ones cultivated bodhisattva practices in the past, a place where they were able to perform difficult deeds of renunciation. Manjushri went there, uh, a place where Buddhas cultivated before they became Buddhas. This was also one of the features of the city of blessings. Hmm. So on our planet right now, um, Bodhgaya is supposed to be one of those places, the place where our Buddha, Shakyamuni Buddha, found his Bodhi tree and sat there uh, 49 days until he woke up under the Ficus Religiosa. So the story goes, depending on who you talk to, that Buddhas always return to Bodhgaya there in India. The conditions are right. What, what do you suppose? That's where they go. Um, it's one of those uh, power points on our planet, for sure. And um, the Mahabodhi Society has put a stupa there. If you go to Bodhgaya, um, there are people who just spend uh, their entire lives under the Bodhi tree there, which is not the original Bodhi tree, it's the grandson of the Bodhi tree. Uh, the original Bodhi tree from the Buddha's time, 2,000 years ago, was cut down by a jealous king uh, at one point in Indian history. But luckily, a scion wood, a branch of it, had been taken to Sri Lanka, and where it flourished further south. And uh, the, at one point, the government of India asked for another clip of the, the second Bodhi tree to come back to Bodhgaya. So the current Bodhgaya, the Bodhi tree, is, uh, is the grandson. And people think uh, here at Gold Coast Dharma Realm we have these marvelous uh, gum trees that are so tall and, and elegant. The Bodhi tree at Bodhgaya, where the Buddha woke up, is not that shape. It is not a tall, towering. It's a fig tree, and it has multiple trunks. It's wide. You, it takes you a while to walk around it because it's so... Uh, the, we have a fig tree right on the bank of our little creek right here at Gold Coast Armour Realm that has multiple trunks. The, Bodhi, the fig tree at Bodhgaya is that way. It's, it's really wide, really wide. And people are on all sides of it, bowing to it, chanting in front of it, meditating around it. I had the, the blessing of spending Christmas Eve under the Bodhi tree once. And, uh, and did I get enlightened? No, I fell asleep. Uh, what do you do under the Bodhi tree at Christmas Eve? You fall asleep. So that's what I did. So having a stupa there where those Buddhas, before they became Buddhas, practiced uh, bodhisattva practices under it, where they were able to perform nansha, how does it go? Nansha, nangsha, right? Uh, let's see here. Nangsha, wuliang, nansha, jutu, right? They were able to perform difficult deeds there. So stupas are one of those um, uh, architectural points of interest. A stupa, baota uh, in Chinese, is a place where relics of past sages are stored. It's a human structure. People build stupas, but it's a, the, in Chinese is gao xian chu. It's a tall, prominent place. And if you have a Buddha, a sharira, the relics of a Buddha, you make your stupa 13 stories tall. 13 stories tall. Yesterday, uh, in 
my lecture about um, Master Empty Cloud, I showed a 13-story stupa from, did I, where did I park those photos? Let's see here. Coaching Su, is that it? Gao uh, Min, uh, 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 let's see here. Not there. Not the kangaroos reclining on the lawn, that wouldn't do it, no. Gao Min Su, let's see here. I believe, let's see here, date modified. I'm searching on my hard drive. Let's see here. Nope. So, I'll have to describe it to you. Uh, I, I had them here and I parked them somewhere. Possibly, one more time. Tian Mushan, not there. Nope. 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 Okay, I give up. So the, uh, the pictures were from Jin Shan Si and Gao Min Si. Gao Min Si is in uh, Jiangsu province. It's where Master Empty Cloud, our teacher's teacher, got enlightened. So at Gao Min Si there is a stupa and it's 13 stories tall which indicates that the, uh, there were Buddha's relics underneath it. Um, in uh, Shi Zhuang in Hubei province, there is a monastery called Bailin Si, White Cedar Monastery. And there's a stupa there, the Zhao Zhou Ta. And the Cultural Revolution came through and destroyed pretty much everything except this stone tower, beautiful architecture. And Master Jing Hui rebuilt all of Bailin Monastery around that Ta. So wherever these uh, structures appear to commemorate the life and cultivation of a Buddha by housing its, its relics, uh, these are sacred spaces. Many miracles happen around stupas because of the relics and the virtue and the cultivation that went into creating those relics. Uh, those are found in the ashes of sages who are cremated and uh, the uh, relics come out of the ashes as testimony to the purity and cultivation of the, of the sage who created them. So um, I remember um, one of the places in San Francisco that has a uh, Sharira stupa, a relic tower, is the Buddhist Churches of America. Um, what's the name of their church? It's the Japanese Buddhist Church. It's one of the oldest uh, Buddhist structures in North America. It's right there uh, on the avenues in uh, San Francisco. And when I, I went with uh, my uh, academic advisor, Dr. Nakasone, to show, he is a, a Japanese Pure Land priest, not, not a monk, but a priest, and ordained in the Jodo Shinshu tradition. And uh, he is also a professor and studies the Avatamsaka. And one day with a bunch of classmates, he and I took them to the roof of the Japanese Buddhist church in San Francisco, where there is a stupa with Sharira in it. And uh, the, uh, the chief uh, priest at the Japanese Buddhist temple said, uh, we're very proud of our relics here. And uh, anybody know why? We asked the students and they're all, uh, don't know why, because they're rare, because they're special. And he said, tell them, I'm sure. And I said, the tradition is that wherever there are Buddha's relics, within a hundred miles, there will be no disasters. And uh, he said, right, now, he said, the earthquake that's supposed to devastate San Francisco is, uh, and there's one in the Hayward Fault that are, both are late. The uh, earthquake that was supposed to devastate San Francisco has been predicted since the 60s. And this was the year 2010. He says, 50 years late. So he says, we're not, 
We're not claiming that it's our Sharira that are keeping San Francisco from the earthquake, but he said, he said we know about your teacher's vows as well, Master Shrinhua. So he said, maybe with your teacher's vows and our Sharira, San Francisco, the earthquake will wait a little longer because we, that's going to be destructive when it finally arrives. But we want to thank the Buddha Sharira and Master Shrinhua's vows for keeping the earthquake away. So, you know, yes, no, huh? do you believe, do you disbelieve? All the same, they say that wherever there are Buddha Sharira, um, it's auspicious. Uh, we want to look on the positive side. Good things come. Bad things stay away, well, that's nice. That, wouldn't that be good? But certainly good things do come. And so here we have what? We have world honored ones cultivating bodhisattva practices in the past and they were able to perform difficult deeds of renunciation. Now, I'm going to, sh I'm going to square share my screen. Um, what are those difficult deeds of renunciation that they share? I will uh, tell you in just a moment. So, for this reason, the Sala Grove, here in the city, east of the City of Blessings, not in the city, but out of, on the, the outskirts, that's where Buddhas show up, in forests, in groves, in parks, on lotus flowers. Um, the gods and the dragons and the eightfold pantheon of spiritual beings come there to make offerings. That's one of the reasons that this place is special. Um, if you've got the, the baddest, meanest, scariest, nastiest leaders of spiritual tribes coming, bowing, and making offerings, you have to know that people pay attention. Who are yakshas? They are people eating ghosts. Who are asuras? Asuras are titans. They're the fighters. They're always fighting with the gods. Who are garudas? Garudas are these gigantic rock, R-O-C, birds that fly, flap their wings and the ocean water dries up. Gandharvas and Kinaras are musical spirits that are, you don't mess around with them. They are fierce and the boss, they're in charge. And under them are armies and legions of Yakshas, Gandharvas, Asuras, Garudas, Kinaras. Maharagas are giant boas, giant snakes, humans and non-humans. All of these beings, instead of causing chaos in the human world, fighting for power and struggling with each other and looking for name and seeing who's the toughest, right? Instead, they come to where the Buddha is because why? They want what the Buddha has. They want liberation from suffering. They want wisdom. They want tzuzai. They want psychic powers. They want to be able to, to be unafraid. So they all bow to the Buddha, who is the baddest of all. That's uh, that particular aspect of uh, the Buddha's uh, community always pleased me no end. They say that, you know, here's this guy. What did he do? He gave up his palace. He gave up his wife. He gave up his power as king. All of the affluence and money and authority and reputation and comfort. Let it go. To do what? To sit under a tree. And by sitting under the tree, he became the baddest cat in the forest. He became absolutely the one that others fear and respect and pay homage to. How about that, right? So, in, uh, when you say Tianlong Babu in China, in the Chinese cultural world, everybody kind of laughs or uh, nods their head because these beings, gods, if God shows up, you bow, right? Dragons show up, you, uh, what do you do? You run or you make a bet. Dragons are the luckiest. 
But when the yakshas, the speedy ghosts, and the Gandharvas, etc., show up, everybody runs for the hills because these are spiritual heavyweights. And, and yet, here they are, following the Buddha and protecting him. These are the Dharma protectors of the Buddha. Okay, there we go. That's the setting for what's about to happen next. We ready? Let's do two more paragraphs. Here we go. Shi Wan Shu Shirli Yu Chi Jen Shu Dao Tsu Chu Yi Chi Yu Chi Chu Shuo Pu Zhao Fa Jie Xiu Do Lo Bai Wan Yi Na Yo Ta Xiu Do Lo Yi Wei Jen Shu Shuo Tsu Jing Shi Yu Da Hai Zhong Yu Wu Liang Bai Qian Yi Zhu Long Er Lai Chi So Wan Si Fa Yi Shen Yen Long Chu Zheng Qiu Fu Dao Xian She Long Shen Sheng Tian Ren Zhong Yi Wan Zhu Long Yu Ano Do Lo Sam Miao Sam Bu Ti De Wu Tui Zhuan After Manjushri and his following reached the adorned banner grove, he immediately proclaimed the Sutra of Universally Illumining the Dharma Realm with hundreds of myriads of millions of Nayutas of sutras as its companions. As Manjushri spoke this sutra, measureless hundreds of thousands of millions of dragons came to the grove from the ocean. Upon hearing the Dharma, they became thoroughly weary of the destiny of dragons. Because they genuinely sought the Buddha's way, they were able to let go of their dragons' bodies and were then reborn in the heavens among gods and among humans. 10,000 dragons became irreversible from Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi. Let's do one more line here. Fu yo wu liang wu shu zhong shang yu san chang zhong ge de tiao fu. Moreover, measureless, numberless, more beings were tamed and subdued by the three vehicles. Okay. So, um, what happens next in our story? Manjushri is coming towards the south. He's reached Sala Grove outside uh, the City of Blessings to the east. And he, um, we don't get the detail of who requested Dharma, but clearly somebody did. And he explains a sutra. And that's interesting, right? Here's Manjushri, not the Buddha. Manjushri is explaining a sutra. So we know that he has been a Buddha before. He's qualified to teach. And his sutra is Pu Zhao Fa Jie Jing. Sutra of illumin lighting up the Dharma realm everywhere shining on the Dharma realm everywhere. And this, this aspect is always curious to me. Sutras have smaller sutras as their companions. <laughs> They're, uh, as some, we used to translate it as retinue or following. So sutras have sutras that accompany them. And to try to explain what, how, how do you make sense of that? I have some theories, and it has to do with the nature of a sutra. And this is totally out of the, my own head. I have no, no evidence for this whatsoever. But Sutras are principles that are fundamentally true in our nature and in capital N, nature. So what is a sutra? A sutra is a principle, a collection of principles. This stuff is true. And when you rely on the principle of the sutra, it, you don't go wrong because it's, it's grooved, it's adjourned, it's, what do you say? Um, it's congruent, it fits in 
the Tao, you could say, how things are in heaven and earth, between heaven and earth, and humanity. Those patterns, those grooves, those uh, pathways, that water course where the rivers run, that's the way things are. And the sutra gives language to it. And you can, the sutra expresses it, the way things are. So a hundred times out of a hundred, that's true. Give an example, cause and effect. That's a principle. Uh, as is the cause, so will be the result. Plant beans, you get beans. You think, yeah, what's so special? Well, it's true, isn't it? You plant beans and you get watermelon? No. And you plant beans and you don't get beans? No. Plant beans, get beans. Plant corn, get corn. Plant watermelon, get watermelon. Treat people kindly, kindness re responds. Treat people harshly, harshless, harshness responds. Those are principles, cause and effect, right? So you'll find that in sutras. That principle is, is enunciated, is expressed in a sutra by, by a speaker of a sutra. The speaker of the sutra gets the sutra from his or her awakened nature, because why? The sutra exists down in human nature. And you can, because it's in human nature, you see it reflected in capital N nature around you. The environment responds when we act according to sutras. When we take this as our blueprint, the house, the mansion, the structure that we build will stand because it's based on principle, based on truth, solid, unchanging, unmoving. They say, uh, shi fang san shi, yi qie, tu fa, right? The dharma that exists in 10 directions and three periods of time, past, present, and future. So this is the dharma. And, okay, so when those principles come out and they're expressed, it sets off ripples. The ripples of that truth are the hundreds of myriads of millions of nayutas of sutras that accompany the teaching of, let's say, for example, the Lotus Sutra, the Avatamsaka, the Sharangama, the Sutra of universally illuminating the Dharma realm. It's so true, it makes waves. And the waves that it makes are the kind of the, the ripples that go off. Um, if you look in our, our human history, which, now, mind you, the, when, you, when you're, we're talking about sutras and Buddhas, you look long. It's got a really, really, really long history. And planets and worlds come into being, abide, decay, and go away and return in the process, this like, long history. So um, I remember at the Parliament of World's Religions in uh, Barcelona, this is 19, mm, was it 2006? Um, the, uh, one of the best exhibits was the, uh, it was a university uh, in Europe who put together a, 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 a timeline for the earth. And they started with, they didn't, it wasn't based on Big Bang, interestingly enough. It started with uh, almost more of a Taoist nature, kind of a, a uh, indigenous uh, Gaia kind of structure where there was swirling energy. There was just fire and the elements swirling. And then it cooled and it shaped into a planet and it showed, and you, the thing about this exhibit was you walked it. You had to walk. It was, it was uh, done with um, poster boards, graphics, and occasional videos. Uh, video was not as hot back then. It wasn't, we didn't have as, wasn't as advanced as it is now. So it was still, still photographs and descriptions. But as you walked, 
you saw how the lifetime of our planet is, if you take it as a clock, we get to 11 hours and 40 minutes before humans appear. <laughs> and we're there for the last 15 minutes before midnight, before 12. And you realize that humans have been alive on our planet for just the last couple ticks of the clock. If 12 noon or 12 midnight is today, is where we are today. So when we say all of human history, <coughs> um, that's just a blink of an eye in the lifespan of a planet and a world system. So these, here we have Manjushri explaining a sutra, describing these principles coming out of his nature, and the millions of nayutas of sutras accompany the lesser uh, vibrations from when truth is proclaimed. Sutras have truth. They're not history books. They're not, there are historical elements. We're in one of them in this today's lecture. There's a little bit of history here. And it's, now you see it, now you don't. Is he really talking about Southern India or is it just spiritual geography? So here's Manjushri explaining a sutra for us so that we can take these principles and build our lives around them. And there are lesser vibrations as it goes out into the culture. And if we think about human history, as brief as it is, what are some of the moments that uh, we consider like milestones that were so important that they echo to this day? And it's hard to find I guess Charlemagne, the Magna Carta, the great law that, that civilized Europe would be one. And what would another one be? The building of the Great Wall of China is like, it stands to this day. Uh, when Qin Shi Huang uh, stabilized Chinese language would be another one. Uh, but it's hard to go back in human history in North American history, we've only got not even 300 years to work with. Australian history, you know, it's just brief. And, and uh, so we have to kind of ex let our minds expand when we hear that Manjushri spoke this sutra and there were hundreds of millions of Nayutas of sutras that were its companions. But things happen as those ripples go out. We hear them and things change. Like what? Speaking that sutra, it seems like Manjushri spoke it for the dragons. Okay, we're heading for the year of the dragon in a week. Measureless, hundreds of thousands of millions of dragons came from the ocean to where Manjushri was. They heard the sutra and said, we don't want to be dragons anymore. <laughs> Can you make it so we don't have to be dragons anymore? Um, and their sincerity, they said, we want to evolve. We want to lose our dragon bodies and become Buddhas instead. They were able, because of that genuine seeking, to let go of their dragon's bodies and become devas. So, look at this. They, and they could also become humans. So there is mobility among the six paths of rebirth. What we're seeing here is these measureless hundreds of thousands of millions of dragons moving from the animal realm to the deva realm and the human realm. They heard the Dharma. They said, we don't want to, dragons have psychic powers. Dragons are in charge of the oceans, of the rainfall, of uh, many realms. And yet they said, no thanks, no more. 
we don't want to be dragons now. Can we, we want to be Buddhas. And as a result, they progressed. They're not Buddhas yet, but they were reborn among the devas and among humans. 10,000 of them made the great Bodhi resolve and became irreversible. They were set on the Bodhisattva path. Irreversible is the seventh and eighth stage. So, numberless more beings were brought into harmony by the three vehicles. So, Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, and two vehicles. So, how about that? I think this is just remarkable. We're in the story of Sudhana. Meanwhile, all these dragons <laughs> get evolved. They evolve. They, they make progress towards Buddhahood, seeking the Buddha's way. How cool is that? Now, um, one of the things that I enjoy the most about the Buddha Dharma is its attitude towards animals. And there are traditions, our Theravada brothers, who will tell you that they have to eat whatever people put in their bowls so they're not entirely vegetarian. We, we respond by saying, receiving blessings, giving, letting lay people make blessings is good, but you also want to help them have wisdom. And they're not forcing you to eat food that involves killing karma. If you give them the wisdom that says, thank you for your generosity, but we would much prefer food offerings that don't involve killing on your part, even taking part in buying food killed by others to give to us. We don't need meat or fish or fish sauce, and you don't need the added karma that comes from offering it to us. So why don't you offer us vegetables and fruits and we'll be happy. Good, you can say that. All right. With that single um, caveat, Buddha Dharma is superb in its attitude towards non-human species. We don't kill animals. In fact, here are dragons who get, make advance towards Buddhahood. I really, really like that. That when you look at a bird, when you look at a fish, when you look at a possum, when you look at a mosquito, you look at the body currently on display and say, you know, there's a Buddha nature inside you. Let's all cultivate together towards Buddhahood, towards a body that doesn't have to be eaten by the earth even. So let's all cultivate together. I'm not going to eat your body and obstruct you that way. So dragons, yeah. Manjushri rides a lion. Samantabhadra rides an elephant. The, the, the story says both the lion and the elephant are Dharma protectors, bodhisattvas. So that's, I really like that. That not only do we hear teachings about dragons, but come on, look at what kind of teachings we have about dragons. Many years ago, after Sudhana became a disciple of Guan Yin, a distressing event happened in the South Sea. The sons of one of the dragon kings was caught by a fisherman while taking the form of a fish, being stuck on land. The son of the dragon king was unable to change back into his dragon form. His father was a mighty dragon king, but as long as his son was on land, he couldn't do anything to help him. So the son called out, help, he said, I've been caught by a fisherman. Hearing the cry, Guan Yin Bodhisattva sent Sudhana to recover the fish and gave him all the money she had, <laughs> as the story goes. The fish at this point was about to be sold for food. It was causing a stir because it was still alive. And people said, how can this fish live so long? It's been out of the water. So a big crowd in the market. 
Many people thought, oh boy, I'd love to eat this fish because I will be immortal. This fish isn't dying. So they wanted to buy him. The bidding war started. Sudhana was outbid, didn't have enough money. Sudhana begged the fish seller to spare the fish. The crowd, now angry at losing the opportunity to be immortal, uh, were trying to take him away from the fish. Guan Yin, from a distance, said, a life should belong to the one who tries to save it, not the one who tries to take it. Principle. The crowd, hearing this voice, and Guan Yin Bodhisattva's voice must have that quality in it, realized and dispersed. They felt shame. Sudhana bought the fish, brought it back to Guan Yin, who put it back in the water. Fish turned back into a dragon, returned home. Paintings of Guan Yin today sometimes show her Yulan, Guan Yin, with a basket of fish, which tells the tale. But the story is not over. As a reward for Guan Yin saving his son, the dragon king sent his granddaughter, Long Yu, dragon girl, to give Guan Yin a pearl, a dragon's pearl. These are the most precious things that dragons have. The pearl of light was a jewel owned by the dragon king that always put out light. Lung Nu, dragon girl, met Guan Yin, was touched by her compassion and said, I want to be your disciple to study the Buddha Dharma. Guan Yin accepted the offer, but one request, you keep the pearl of light, dragon girl. So that's one of the legends of how dragon girl and Sudhana are often seen alongside Guan Yin as two young people. Dragon Girl is either holding the pearl, uh, Sudhana has his palms together to show that he is bowing and he is docile, easily taught. Okay, one, two, in Buddha Dharma, we know the names of the Buddha, of the dragon kings. How about that? Where else but Buddha's teachings do, uh, do, do we get to learn the family dynamics of the dragons? Nanda, Upananda, Sagara. Uh, Sagara's daughter is, is the, the dragon girl. Vasuki, Takshaka, Anabatapta, Manasvin, Utpalaka, Muchilinda, and Elopatra are the names of the dragon kings that appear in Buddha Dharma, in Buddha's teachings. I just think it's so cool. Uh, let's see here. We've got, uh, let's see. Shurfu has, let's see here, here we go. In Shurfu's writing, he has a story with a poem about Dragon Girl. What does he say? Uh, let's see here. Ijo, Ijo Bachinian. Ijo Bachinian. There we go. This is 1987 at City of 10,000 Buddhas. Manjushri, Bodhisattva. Make it bigger. There we go. Manjushri, Bodhisattva, went to the Dragon Palace to teach the Lotus Flower Sutra and to take across numerous, numberless, dragons in the assembly to bring them into the Dharma so they could be liberated from their, the suffering of the dragon's body. They say that being a dragon isn't that great because um, you get sand in between your scales and it itches, they say. That's what they say. Uh, take it on faith. So uh, the dragon girl was eight years old and she had tremendous wisdom. She really had potential to understand the Dharma. And uh, she, she was able to, even at age eight as a dragon, she had received and understood and could cultivate a lot of the Buddha's teaching expressed in the Tripitaka, particularly the secret school, the mantras and the mudras. She was a great meditator. She could deeply immerse herself in samadhi, and understand the Dharma. 
Um, she made the Bodhi resolve in a split second, like that, and then realized right awakening. So here's this eight-year-old girl, female of the species, but a dragon. And because of her study of, uh, of the Dharma, she makes the Bodhi resolve and then realizes enlightenment. Now, one of the attendants on uh, many jewels to Tagata's, uh, one, of, one of his uh, servants, whose name was Zhiji Pusa, Bodhisattva accumulating wisdom, had some doubts and didn't hesitate to express them. He said, here's a quote from the attendant to many jewels to Tagata. The Buddha has gone through 3,000 large thousand world systems, dust mote numbers of lives, and in every lifetime he gives up his body, Li Sanda Asanchijie. He became a Buddha only after three great Asankhya eons of doing this. Yun Ho Tsunyu Nang Zai Shuyo Cheng Fo Na. How could this girl become a Buddha on a split second like that? How is this possible? He was obviously feeling uh, kind of, this isn't fair. <laughs> so uh, having voiced his complaint, having, uh, so having heard his complaint, the dragon girl appeared, Shen Shen just appeared poof like that, made a body appear, bowed at the Buddha's feet and praised the Buddha in verse. Shariputra, this is a great story because we've got Manjushri and Shariputra and the dragon girl all together. Venerable Shariputra asked the dragon girl, the daughter of the dragon king, the Buddha has cultivated blessings and wisdom for three uh, Sankhya eons by Jie Chung Xianghao and gathered the hallmarks on his body over a hundred eons. His threefold awakenings are complete. His virtue is full. Uh, Fang Zheng, Zheng Jie, only after these qualities, after these qualifications over this period of time, does he realize correct awakening. Ru Shi Nu Shan, you're in a female body, you have fivefold obstacles. What are the conditions, please, that allow you to become a Buddha in a female body? A little bit of misogyny here, or maybe a lot of misogyny here, right? Long Nu Shen Zhu Yu Fo, the dragon girl made the pearl appear, this fabulous pearl. It was a gift to, Man, to Manjushri. And she gave it to the Buddha. Just pop, like that. She said to the Buddha, oh, was that quick? She said, the answer was, that was quick. The dragon girl suddenly appeared as a male in a male's body and went off to the south to the world called Stainless, where she became a Buddha. So she, became, she said, I'll make a male body appear. I can make the pearl appear, I'll, I'll appear as a male. You're attached to forms, fine. Went off to the southern world called Stainless and became a Buddha there. That's Master Hua's essay about Dragon Girl. So, praise. Able to let go of what is hard to let go of, just like our verse, like our sutra, right? Remember, it said, a place where they were able to perform difficult deeds of renunciation, right there. This is a difficult deed, to let go of pearl. Uh, that is the most precious thing for a dragon. Able to renounce what is hard to let go of, able to practice what is difficult to practice, able to permit what is difficult to permit, able to accomplish 
what is hard to accomplish, able to cross over what is hard to get beyond, able to cultivate what is hard to cultivate, able to realize what is the hardest thing to accomplish, able to obtain what others cannot obtain. That's his verse. I like Shurfu's poetry. It's very cool. He was truly not bound by convention. So the title of this essay is The Dragon Girl Makes Her Pearl Appear. So he, uh, he wrote a second verse to accompany his first verse. Here it goes. The dragon, curl, the dragon girl made her pearl appear and quickly became a Buddha. She crossed over uh, a s- countless eons and the Dharma body came alive. Her Dharma body came alive. She set aside all 10,000 conditions and recognized her fundamental substance, her fundamental identity with not a single speck of dust defiling her Buddha nature, she awoke, she awoke to paramitas, mito. The Dharma flower assembly uh, experienced this uncanny event. In the, wor- in the stainless world, she becomes the Mahayana, Shi Jie Yin Yuan. The the time has come, her conditions came together. So it is, so it is. Truly inconceivable, truly unspeakable, truly unable to be expressed. So in Shurfu's verse, he, um, this is a beautiful verse, he says, yeah, it's unusual for a young, for an eight-year-old dragon girl to become a Buddha. She did it. That's just how it is. So it is. So it is. Hard to express. And the, uh, this is a story from the Lotus Sutra about how the, uh, the men who are struggling along trying to become Buddhas complain. Wait a minute, wait a minute, she's just a girl. How did she become a Buddha? You know, we thought it was going to take a long time. And the dragon girl says, "Uh uh-huh, yep, there it is. She becomes a man, she goes off to a different world, becomes a Buddha on the spot. Very cool. Um, There's another, let's see, this is another commentary. The dragon girl takes her pearl and becomes a Buddha. Biao Yi Cheng. This is to say this shows that her conditions were complete and full. In the chapter of Devadatta, the dragon girl has a pearl which is uh, more valuable than anything in the world. She gives it to the Buddha. The Buddha accepts it. And this renunciation, any other dragon would have kept the pearl. She gave it to the Buddha. The Arhats could not do that. Um, she gets challenged by the Bodhisattva accumulating wisdom and by Shariputra. <coughs> and she says, I gave my pearl, the Buddha took it, Shi Shi Jifa. Was this quick? Yes, it was. Uh, she says, Yi Nu Shen Li Guan Wo Cheng Fu Fu Yu. She says, Use your spiritual powers and watch me become a Buddha. It'll be even quicker, she says. So, <laughs> kind of cheeky, kind of, yeah. Okay, lots of dragon stuff. How cool. Um, so here we are, um, coming into the year of the dragon. And in our sutra, um, my goodness, countless numbers of dragons uh, reborn out of their dragon bodies in the heavens um, and among humans to continue their cultivation of the Buddha's path. So very timely in the year of the dragon.
All righty. Um, again, it's so much fun to be able to uh, dig into dragon stories and tree stories. This is uh, aspects of the Dharma that completely cross over into folklore and into the present world. And yes, it is Buddha Dharma directly from the sutras. Yes, it is folklore of China and Korea and Japan and China and India and wherever there are indigenous cultures worldwide, Gaia, with trees that are the place where you wake up. You need a tree. Uh, Yggdrasil, I knew I would. The, uh, the name of the, the tree that is the center of the Yggdrasil, the center of the uh, Yggdrasil. There it is. Norse mythology. This is another place. Here it is. Old Norse. The mighty tree whose trunk rises at the geographical center of the Norse spiritual cosmos. The rest of that cosmos is arrayed around it and is held together by branches and roots. Uh, the well-being of the cosmos depends upon the well-being of the tree. When the tree shakes, Ragnarok, the end of the universe, has come. So um, here's a picture of a tree with a dragon on it. Right? With a snake. The snake is the, drum, the protector. The dragon protects the tree. Um, it's an ash, but nobody knows what tree it is. Um, the dragon, Nidok, and several snakes are protectors there. So, dragons and trees in Norse mythology um, have the same resonance. Here we are. There's the tree. Here's the snake or the serpent or the dragon. There it is, Yggdrasil. So, um, very neat. As I mentioned at the beginning, uh, of the lecture, this is one of those places where we um, find, here we go, some of the better illustrations of the tree at the center. There he is. Viking mythology, right? The tree at the center of the world. Here it is. And the worlds that surround it. Yeah, so it's, it's a fascinating juncture of was it the sutras brought up by the Buddha from, the, um, from his awakened nature that then filtered down and became folklore, folk tales? Was it that these uh, are fundamentally true everywhere and when people wake up, there they, there they are waiting to be passed on? It could be that. Again, it's a chicken and an egg kind of situation. There's no, uh, it's, it's a seam, it's a cycle. So there's no edge that you pick up and say, this is the first. One leads to the other. But to have uh, as our teachings this deep insight uh, into when the mind is awake, nature, humanity, tian di ren, human, humanity, earth, and heaven are all in, in harmony. So, um, before we get our report from Berkeley, I wanted to, to do our story here. We have uh, this coming Friday, our Chinese Lunar New Year blessing ceremony. Folks are welcome to come if you can. Um, this is not online, is it? It is online. It is online. Okay, good. Go to our website, gcdr.org, and you'll find the link. Um, we have a Medicine Buddha blessing, candle lighting, uh,
entertainment performance by members of the community, then Saturday, the 10th of February, we'll have a Medicine Buddha repentance and chance for folks to create merit. Oh, I did it again. Got to show my... There we go. There it is. That's our poster. So please take a look. Uh, gcdr.org.au is where you find our website with more information. Okay, uh, we'll put that away. And uh, Jin Chuan, Jin Wei, hi, you want to tell us a little bit about what's going on there? Sure. We just finished our first day of meditation here at Berkeley Buddhist Monastery. We had about maybe 25 to 30 people show up for our intro to meditation class. And maybe 10, 15 stayed in the afternoon to continue to meditate. Some came all the way down from Ukiah to join us. So it's quite, quite wonderful to have a community here. Cool. Um, just to give go by the website, though, so the, if you go to the very top, Dara Master, um, there's the Lunar New Year. So for those who would like to celebrate Lunar New Year at the monastery, we'll begin at 9 a.m. reciting Om Mani Padme Hum, as has been our tradition for many years. And we'll have a lunch together, and Brother Hong Shu will actually share a reflection with us from all the way from Australia from wow. 12 30 to 1. So, lots of I believe that's like, that's like 3 a.m. or something for you, right, Dharma Master? Yeah, 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 dragon stories. If I'm if I can prop my eyes open, we'll tell dragon stories. Great. So, Lunar New Year, not to be missed, a lot of festivity. And then we'll go back to our meditation session. So, you'll see there. 3rd, the 4th, 11th, 17th, and 18th, and the 24th, basically all the weekends, we will be having a meditation session for everyone to join publicly from 9 to 11 and 12.30 to 3.15 p.m. And we're also opening up our morning and evening sits on a daily basis for this month of February for those who want to keep a meditation practice going um, on a daily basis. We also modify the schedule a little bit so those who wish to just sit for 30 minutes can do so. You'll see that from 6.45 to 7.15 a.m. And also in the evenings, we're, we're meditating from 5 to 5.30 and then 5.45 to 6.15. That way, those who are new um, have a way to join without feeling too big of a stretch. We found an hour is really hard to start with, but 30 minutes is, is doable. Okay. And that's our meditation class. You can find just the dates. So the next one will be on February 11th on Sunday. And then it'll be the following two Saturdays. Um, and our focus is on first the body, then the heart, then kind of the field, the surroundings, and then kind of connecting with the sacred. And just, um, just a way to approach meditation from these different angles. Okay. Yeah. Good. Yep. Yeah, that's, I think, pretty much we have a couple other things. Chinese music ensemble is still happening. Yep. So you can join if you like. And our, I believe Marty also said his class will begin next week on Friday. Oh, okay. So for those who are soon tuning in, I believe he'll be starting February 9th. Uh, his okay. Avatamska lectures as well. Right. Then we have Guanyin Retreat. Yeah, Sudan, Guanyin Retreat, Sudan Sudan Retreat, Suna Center Retreat, Buddha Farm. Farm. I know there's friends from Australia coming, joining us, yep, Snow Mountain Monastery. Big group from Australia. Snow Mountain Retreat. Yep. May Bodhisattva Precepts. Precepts. I believe that's the yep. February 1st, so it's the applications are They're actually what, closed over. by now. Yeah, no, we should we'll probably take that, off the, take that off the website. I will do uh, that right now. Okay. And then picture biography on Saturdays or Fridays. Then, uh, so Marty's lecture will start up. We'll move that up. Then uh, the Saturday night, Sunday night, Avatamska lecture at City of 10,000 Buddhas. Okay. Well, thank you for the report. Appreciate that. And uh, we're going to conclude today with the dedication of merit and uh, I'd like to invite folks to recite Medicine Buddha's mantra uh, as our dedication 
do it three times and send out good healing vibration. Um, COVID is rampant in, in Australia right now. And uh, please dedicate however you would care to share your merit and virtue with everyone. teacher. You're welcome to bow right from where you're sitting if you care to. to the Venerable Master. That's going to do it for us for today. We'll see you all next week. Omi Tofu. Bye, everybody.